Hello everyone. On behalf of Rumi Forum, I would like to welcome all of you to this program. Uh, before we start, uh, I would like to introduce uh, Imam Farid to you very shortly. Uh, Imam Vernon M. Farid is a member of the Virginia Center for Inclusive Comedi Communities, VCIC, an organization originally founded as NCCJ, National Conference of Christians and Jews. As a member of this organization, he serves on its state board and is also chair of the Tidewater chapter. VCIC is a human relations organization that conducts programs that promote understanding and respect on all issues of diversity for all age groups all across Virginia. Some of the organization's many programs focuses on creating inclusive workplace culture, exploring roots of prejudice, and responding to bullying and harassment. Imam Farid is also the resident Imam, the leader, of a Norfolk religious community named Masjid, Masjid William Salam. He also served on the Minister's Advisory Committee to Norfolk's Police Chief, and he is currently a member of the Park Place Civic League. Moreover, Farid is on the FBI Multicultural Advisory Board, and in this capacity, he functions as a connect between the community and this agency. Imam Vernon Farid also serves on the Executive Committee of Religions for Peace, RFP USA. This global organization has affiliates in six regions, including Asia, Africa, Latin America, Europe, the Middle East, and North Africa. He is married to Ms. Sueya, and together they have five children and several grandchildren. With this, I will leave the floor to him. Please join me in welcoming Imam Farid. Thank you, Thank you very much. I want to say I'm honored and pleased to be here uh, to address you on a, a subject that uh, I've been asked to talk about. I want to thank the Rumi Forum for this invitation. Uh, to speak to you and uh, thank God, thank Allah for the relationship that we have had with the Muslims, our Muslim brothers from Turkey uh, by various, through various uh, groups that they have, the Rumi Forum, uh, the Raindrop uh, uh, Foundation out of Texas and others that we've had the pleasure of interacting with. Um, my subject today is the role of African American African-American Muslims in the history or the, the establishment of Al-Islam in America. And <laughs> towards that end, <laughs> when we can look at the, uh, the history uh, of America in relationship to Muslims, the presence of Muslims here. We can, there's evidence, strong evidence, that Muslims have been present in the United States of America as early as the uh, 12th century. Uh, there's a document called the, the Sung document, S-U-N-G, the Sung document. And that document is a Chinese document that uh, has strong evidence that Muslims came here uh, by, by ship, by boat, uh, for voyages and expeditions here in America. Uh, there are also other, there's other evidence that Muslims came from Mali and from uh, in Africa, some other countries, uh, as early as the 12th and 13th century. So there's been a long, long history of Muslims' presence here in America. As we fast forward, right here in this city, Washington, D.C., uh, there's evidence of a man, uh, strong evidence, documented history, of a man by the name of Yaro, uh, Yaro Mahmoud, who was freed. He was freed after Congress passed a law in 1808, prohibiting the import of slaves uh, from other countries. So as a result of that, he was free. He became a, a founding member, uh, one of the initial members of a bank here. I believe it's called Commerce Bank, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but he was, um, uh, and that bank was the second bank <coughs> to become a chartered bank in the United States. He was a Muslim. So these are very important 
uh, things that happened in the history of Muslims in America. Now, uh, as we fast forward, there's, there's quite a bit of history and we don't have enough time to talk about all of the different uh, people, the different uh, events, the dates, et cetera. We don't have time to discuss all of that. So for the sake of me getting to the heart of what I've been asked to talk about, I want to mention, uh, fast forward and talk about uh, movements, movements as opposed to individuals. We know that uh, many individuals came here and many in individuals have been here in America again for a long time and they have been Muslims. Uh, many of them when they came here they would change their names because the climate was not conducive for Islam in America. So they would change their names. Their name was Yusuf, they would come here and they would change their name to Joe. The name was Muhammad, they would change it to Mo. They would change it from whatever it was, their, their given name, to a name, an uh, English name, a European name, so that they could move freely in American society, uh, undetected, so to speak, uh, and not have uh, discrimination heaped upon them. So when we talk about movements, we have to look at a man by the name of uh, Drew, um, Drew Ali. Uh, he, named, came to be, uh, he, he came to be known as Noble Drew Ali. Uh, he began a movement in the early 1900s, I believe around 1913. And it began in Newark, New Jersey, where he established the Morris Science um, Temple. And he moved his, this movement, or he moved himself later to Chicago where he established a temple there in Chicago. And as it spread, his movement spread, he went to other cities, uh, Philadelphia, right here in Washington, D.C., uh, Detroit, and other cities. And that movement, uh, though it's, it has a connection with Islam, uh, what he practiced, what he preached, what he believed in, as well as those who followed him, was not purely Islam. And I say that to say that it was not based on the Quran, and it was not based on the leadership and teaching of the Prophet Muhammad, the prayers and peace be on the Prophet. So, but uh, it is, it is uh, usually connected with the, the history and the establishment of Islam in America. Some uh, say that he was commissioned by the uh, Moroccan uh, people, the authorities in Morocco, to come here and to spread Islam to the uh, so-called Negro, or black man, or African American, as we later, later came to be called. Uh, that was his mission that he, he was given that mission to, 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 to spread Islam to, to, to us as a people, many of us who are here who are of African American descent. So um, that movement uh, is sometimes credited with the beginning of Islam in America and being very, very powerful and influential in the establishment of Islam in America. Now, uh, as I talk, I, it's certainly my, not my intent to offend anybody. But I think it's important, uh, the subject is important. And the subject is more important than me, the speaker. Uh, because it would be remiss, just as it would be remiss for African American people to dismiss those who came before us, those who are here now, those who are able to move about freely in America, usually undisturbed, uh, not discriminated against, usually. That's not to say that we don't have discrimination. Not to say that we don't suffer uh, biasness and bigotry and hatred and uh, things like that. But for the most part, we have, we're free now. We have freedom. We have freedom of movement. Uh, we can eat what we want to eat. We can stay at the hotels where we want to stay, et cetera, et cetera. But people sacrificed. People died. People were hung. People were lynched. People were in prison to give us the freedom to do the things that we do today. And those things are not to be taken for granted. So in the same vein, it would be remiss for Muslims who have come to America from various parts of the world, uh, whether it be from Egypt, from Saudi Arabia, from Pakistan, or wherever, to not, uh, so it's, it would not just be a, 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 an oversight on uh, history, but it would be an oversight on the credit that is due to those persons who lost their lives 
who were in prison, who were discriminated against, etc., uh, who work to establish a presence for Islam in America. And as I said, uh, Drew Ali and his followers, they would uh, take on the name Bay and different names as, as his movement grew. Uh, that movement was not a movement that was purely based in Islam. It was not purely based in the Quran and the, and the life example and teachings of Prophet Muhammad. Uh, we say Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the prayers and peace be on the Prophet. But uh, nevertheless, uh, something, it was a movement. And it had, a, uh, it had some elements of it in the teaching that were related to Islam. Now, as we fast forward, years later in the early 30s, there was a group of people, we know this now, we didn't know this then, but there was a group of people who had studied the plight of the African American people who had come here mostly by force, by ship, we were brought here as slaves, put in slavery, and discriminated against. They had studied our history and they had studied um, the religious persuasion that we had embraced and for many it was Christianity that had been given to us by the slave masters and those who held our ancestors in, in, in slavery. And so they wanted to bring, uh, plant the seed of Islam in America. They wanted to plant a seed here. And there was a man by the name of W.D. Farad, W.F. Muhammad, he went by various names and various disguises, who was the agent for this group. He came to America, he met a man by the name of Elijah Poole, uh, who had a third grade education. He later changed his name, he changed his name, Farad changed his name after he, be, he became his student and his disciple. Uh, he later changed his name to Elijah Kareem. And uh, upon his death, uh, he was known as Elijah Muhammad, or more, more specifically, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. He was known by that name. There, there are some who want to erase that man out of history, who don't want to give credit to him or to the movement that he started. And the movement that he started was called the Nation of Islam, as we all know, many of us know here. The Nation of Islam was far more successful in terms of uh, growing the, the idea, getting the name out, of Islam, getting the, for the first time, many people in America were hearing the name Muhammad. They were hearing the word Allah. They were hearing Allahu Akbar. They were hearing expressions that they had never heard before for the first time. And it was largely because of that movement called Nation of Islam that was headed by a man named Elijah Muhammad, Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Uh, now, we, we know now, we know now that that movement and that teaching that was a part of that movement was not Islam. It was not the, pure, the purity of the Quran. It was not the, the, the teachings and, and it did not uh, exemplify in some areas the life example and teaching of the Prophet Muhammad, prayers and peace be on the Prophet. We know that now. But God, Allah, blesses those who are sincere. And because the followers of that movement, and the leader himself even, was sincere. Now remember, we're talking about a man who had a third grade education. A man who is not a, a Harvard graduate, graduate by any stretch of the imagination. A man who did not even uh, had any, not one, one credit of uh, college, college uh, education. A man who had not even uh, gone so far as high school, not even middle school. A man who had a third grade education, who was uh, basically moved by, with his common sense, what common sense he had and a sincere desire to see his people change their condition. So as I fast forward, again for the sake of time, much I would like to say, but as I fast forward, uh, what Elijah Muhammad had was given to him. It was given to him by a group of people from uh, countries in the Middle East, from a country in the Middle East. And that ideology was the catalyst for growing and spreading 
Islam in America. As a result of that, there were temples. They were called temples at that time. They sprang up all over, all over the country. Temple number one being in Detroit, temple number two being in Chicago, number three in Milwaukee, number four right here in Washington, D.C. And they spread all around the country. And so, as, uh, as uh, later, the son of Elijah Muhammad, Imam W.D. Muhammad, uh, became the, the leader after the passing of Elijah Muhammad, his son, uh, Imam, some say Wallace, Wallace Muhammad, Imam, some say Wardi Thuddin Muhammad, but uh, he preferred to be called Imam W. Dean Muhammad, uh, who passed just a, a few years ago. May Allah forgive him his errors and grant him paradise. Uh, he departed with the teaching of his father. In fact, before his father passed, he made it known that he did not agree with the teaching that his father uh, had been promoting, uh, that he did not accept the one that his father had presented as God. Uh, he did not accept that we would classify a whole race of people as a race of devils, meaning the white race. Uh, and he, he, he uh, upon becoming the leader, he, he put out a challenge. He put out a challenge to those who were ministers at that time, and he said that if any of you feel that you're better qualified to lead this movement than I am, then you should come forward. But your challenge should, to me should be based on your knowledge of the Quran and the life example and teachings of Prophet Muhammad, the prayers and peace be on him. And not one stood up and challenged him at that time. So he moved that whole movement called Nation of Islam from the direction that it was going in, from the ideology that it had, from the philosophy that it embraced, from the teachings that were espoused, to the belief, the teaching that there is but one God, and Muhammad is a messenger of God. We say, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. So, um, uh, my presentation has to be very short. I keep within the time frame, so I have to skip through a lot of things that I want to say. But uh, it's, it's sufficient to say that a groundwork was laid, a foundation was laid for many, for the first time, who could now, they could change their names back from Joe and back to Yusuf. They could stop calling themselves Mo and now call themselves Muhammad because a groundwork and a foundation had been laid uh, 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 for the presence of Islam in America and for the acceptance of this new faith, this new religion in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, so again, but there, we have to remember that people lost their lives, people were in prison, people were discriminated against, people were mistreated, and so on and so forth because they had names that had not before been known, they had embraced a religion that was not known well in the West, particularly here in America, the religion of Islam, Al-Islam as we properly call it. And so it would be remiss on the part of people in America, the people of America, the historians in America, because it's not, it's not just some Muslims who have come here from other parts of the world and have tried to brush this history under the rug, uh, push this under the rug. It is also historians, historians here in America who have neglected to point out this fact that is a fact of how Islam began and how it spread in part, in large part, because of the role of African Americans under the leadership of the man who was once known as the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, and more specifically, more importantly, under the leadership of Imam W.D. Muhammad. Uh, in, in concluding my, my, my presentation, there are some figures, uh, historical figures, and uh, again, when I say that the historians have sought to brush this under the rug or sweep this under the rug, uh, one of the things I mean by that is this, that a lot of times more importance is put on these other figures. Uh, we talk a lot about Malcolm X. Many don't know the real history of Malcolm X. They don't know how he started. They don't know how he evolved. They don't know about his going to Mecca and who he talked to before he went to Mecca. It was Imam W.D. Muhammad that he talked to before he went to Mecca. It was Imam W.D. Muhammad who told him what he would see in Mecca, that he would see people of white skin, black skin, brown skin, red skin, yellow skin, speaking every conceivable language on the face of the earth from every part of the globe, and they would all be saying, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. It was Imam W.D. Muhammad who told Malcolm X about those things. So Malcolm did, Malcolm did not know uh, the, the Quran. He was not familiar with the Quran. Uh, as as uh, Imam Muhammad was, 
and he was not familiar with the life example and teachings of Prophet Muhammad. But we hear a lot about Malcolm. We hear a lot about uh, some other popular figures uh, and less about uh, those persons who were really uh, their leaders, their leaders, and in many cases responsible for them growing, uh, coming to the point and stage in life that they had, they had come to. So uh, uh, I just want to end my talk by saying that uh, we, we are grateful and we don't say this to be boasting and bragging and to be putting anybody down or try to make anybody feel bad, but it, it would be a sad state, a uh, sad statement on any person, whether they are uh, Native Americans, whether they come here from other countries, whether they are historians, uh, whether they are Muslims, Christians, Jews, or whatever, to overlook the contributions of the people who are of African American descent and the people who came through that movement called Nation of Islam and eventually came to embrace the Quran and accept Allah as the God and Muhammad as his messenger, the prayers and peace be on the Prophet. Thank you. Well, uh, Imam Farid, thank you very much for this informative speech. Thank you. Um, now I think we are going to move on to uh, the Q&A sec section. Okay. Um, if you allow me to ask the first question. Sure. Um, at the beginning of your speech, you talked about the uh, Song document, mm -hmm. uh, which dates back to, I think, 12th century. Um, do we n know um, details of, of these documents, what this document talks about, uh, and what is the uh, relationship of this document to Muslims? Generally, these documents talk about Muslims who were uh, in various parts of the country who made voyages uh, by boat, by ship, or whatever. Uh, they came here to America before uh, Columbus. Okay. You know, uh, we have documentation, uh, historical documentation uh, from a European perspective mm -hmm. uh, where they talk about America being founded by Columbus, this new land, this new country being founded by Columbus. But what we don't hear a lot about is those persons who came here from various parts of the world who came here and uh, um, some of them settled. Some of them settled and stayed. Some of them came just to explore. Uh, they came here for different reasons. Some of them would go back and some of them stayed. We hear very little about those things. So uh, this sung document that I, I, I have alluded to is just one of many uh, uh, forms of documentation and evidence that Muslims, Muslims came here as explorers uh, Muslims had the, the knowledge, the wherewithal, based all the way back to really the prophet and the, and the inspiration of the Quran being the herald of the sciences, that they had the ability to navigate. Mm -hmm. That knowledge of navigation was in large part inspired by uh, Islam, by Al-Islam, and by the Quran more specifically. Thank you. You're welcome. Now uh, we can take questions. Yes. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, That's I'm not okay. the moderator. That's Excuse okay. me. <laughs> Please. Um, Salaam alaikum. Wa alaikum As a follow up to that, I, I wanted to, I know um, I took a course recently called uh, Western Sunrise, and in that course, the um, instructor, Abdullah Hakim Quick, who yes. you probably know, yes. was talking about Cheng Ho, who we know as Cheng Ho, mm -hmm. um, who was one of the Chinese net sailors, or yes. actually, um, would you call him the uh, admiral mm -hmm. of, of a Chinese uh, ship? And um, I don't know though if he came to America, but it was said that he he was Muslim. Yes. And even possibly Ahlul Bayt, meaning from the family of the Prophet Muhammad. Right. Right. So this is uh, again something that's not well known and yeah. definitely not taught. The fact of Cheng Ho has come out in the last, I guess, maybe five, six years. The the fact. Yes. I don't know if he actually came here to America, but I understand his last voyage, he docked his ship and went for Hajj. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Now, we have um, a gentleman in the back. Brother. Um, <coughs> yes. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum um, I wonder if you could hazard a guess as to um, why exactly there's been this glaring neglect in terms of the history of African Americans, and also, um, can you address um, what might be the impact if this uh, glaring neglect was remedied and more people understood 
uh, uh, how Islam came to be rooted here in this part of the world. Yes. Um, you know, uh, language is very important to us. I say to us, uh, it should be important to all of us as, as people, as individuals. It's important to us uh, who are Muslims. And, uh, you know, when I'm, for example, uh, I hear uh, African-American Islam. You know, I hear language like that, African-American Islam. Well, there's no such thing as African-American Islam. There's one Islam, there's Al-Islam. And that's what Allah, God says in the Quran, there's Al-Islam. Uh, and I, I'm saying that to answer your question, to respond to your question about the, the oversight and neglect that uh, many have, have shown towards uh, acknowledging this history. Uh, again, uh, history, uh, history, when it's documented, it should be accurate. It should be truth. And let the chips fall where they may. Uh, to neglect history, the truth, to truth is to spread a lie. To neglect the truth is to spread a lie. And if the truth about how Islam began, how it flourished, because uh, I mentioned uh, Drew Ali, noble Drew Ali, for example, and I mentioned uh, his movement. Well, at the height of his movement, according to records, all the records that I've seen, he had no more than about 35,000 followers. That was nationwide, no more than about 35,000 followers. We know that, uh, in contrast, the movement called Nation of Islam became one of the most powerful movements in America. And that was not only by our estimation, uh, the, the major media outlets in America uh, dubbed it as being uh, one of the most powerful movements and the, mo the leader of that movement as being one of the most powerful uh, black men at that time, as they would say, uh, in America. So uh, the, 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 the problem that, would, would, that would, would occur if this is not rectified is that uh, there will be false prophets, I'm going to use the word prophets, claiming to be uh, the ones who were responsible for this, planting this seed and growing. Uh, growing